This is Physics 1A for what is that, March 5th. Uh, today we're going to be talking about rotational quantities of um, kind of like rotational kinematics, uh, moments of inertia, uh, as well as um, possibly getting into some things about angular momentum, depending on how much we can cover. So, um, so yeah, so let's talk about rotational kinematics. Okay, so let's say that you have an object that's traveling in a circular path. So we start with a circle. And at the center of the circle. So let's say we have an object that's traveling in a circle, okay? And at one point in time, it is at one point on the circle. And let's say that it moves to another position right here. And let's plop a xy axis on top of this too. Okay, so that this is going to be our x direction, and this will be our y direction. Although we're not going to use these variables, well, we might in a little bit, but for now we won't be. Um, and so we have an object, let's say some mass, doesn't really matter what it is, that moves from this point to this point right here. It could be you could have like a wheel and the wheel's rotating and you're following a point on the wheel. Uh, you could have like a merry-go-round and you're looking at a child that's moving around the merry-go-round. Uh, either way, so the object starts uh, at this initial position and moves to this final position right here. And that occurs over some time intervals, so we'll say that it takes some time delta t to go from there up to there. And we'd like to be able to describe uh, the motion of this of this object uh, using kind of new quantities other than um, in the past we've always used like x, y, and z to define the position of an object. And then we talked about the object's velocity and its acceleration. Um, we'd like to do the same thing for rotation. So imagine an object that's traveling only along a circular path and we want to define the same kind of quantities. So to do that, um, we're going to define the initial angle that's made right here to be theta naught. And that'll be the angle that's made with the positive x-axis like this. And then we'll define the angle from the positive x-axis to the final position to be theta final. Let me, oh, maybe I can draw it out here so I can still have room to draw things inside here. So we'll go from here to here, and we'll call that theta final. I think I am going to need to make that different color so that it's clear what I'm actually writing. Let's move here. Let's move some things around a little bit. Let's scooch that one in there. And then use green to go from here up to here, and we'll call that theta final. Okay. And then the the change in the angle will be in between. So from here to here, we're going to call that delta theta. And over here, I'll define that the change in the angle, we're going to call that um, the angular displacement. And it can be measured in radians, uh, revolutions, or um, degrees, probably usually going to be measured in radians or revolutions, though. So that's how we're going to measure that. And that's going to tell you kind of how far something has rotated. Um, the angle theta, like theta initial or theta final itself, uh, is then basically just the angular position. It's a position of where the object is, but it's measured relative to how far it's rotated. Okay, and if we do that, and we know that it takes some amount of time, delta t, to move from initial to final, then we can define uh, angular velocity. And uh, angular velocity is going to be basically the, um, well, we can, we're going to use the symbol omega, and 
we can talk about average angular velocity. And that's going to be equal to the change in the angle divided by the change in time. So the angular displacement divided by uh, the amount of time that, that elapses. And when I use this symbol, normally, um, this is going to be measured in radians per second, usually. So delta theta over delta t is going to give you the angular velocity, the rate at which the angle is changing. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in radians per second. And then we can do the same thing that we did early, early on, and we can define instantaneous angular velocity as omega. And this is going to be the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta theta over delta t. And that will then be equal to the, the derivative of the angle with respect to time, or the, the rate of change of the angular position with respect to time. So we use that symbol omega. All right. Now, when we uh, defined velocity uh, in like the third chapter, we said the velocity was a vector. And angular velocity is also a vector, OK? But the way that it's a vector is a little bit different. Um, and uh, the way that it works is uh, if you have an object that rotates in the way that this object is rotating here, it's going to have an angular speed because it moved from some initial position to a final position. It took some time and its angle changed. So this object is going to have an angular speed. And it's going to turn out that in this case, it's going to point out of the page. Okay. We learned um, about something called the right hand rule. We were talking about torque. And the right hand rule works in this situation too, where if you basically take your hand and you you point your fingers in the direction of the initial kind of radius vector, and you wrap your hand from the initial radius vector to the final radius vector, so you go from here to here, and you use your right hand, then your thumb is gonna end up pointing out of the page, and that's gonna be the direction of the angular velocity vector, okay? An easier way to see that is if I draw a picture over here, let's say, of an object that's rotating, So looking at like a, a kind of a circular disc that might be rotating, where we're looking at it on its edge, as if you took like a coin and you looked at its edge. Um, let's say that this object is rotating about an axis that goes this way. And let's say that it's rotating in this direction. So it has an angular speed in that direction. And we want to define what the, um, uh, the vector for the angular velocity is going to be. So again, angular velocity can be a vector, which we symbolize by putting a vector symbol over it like that. And again, the way that you define how this vector is oriented is you just, you, you wrap your fingers in the direction of rotation. So if it's rotating like this, around like this, then if you wrap your fingers in this direction, what direction does that make your thumb point? If you take your right hand and you wrap your fingers in the direction that it's rotating, what direction is your thumb up upwards, right? So that ends up being the direction of the velo the angular velocity vector. So we'll use a actual vector for that. And I'll try to straighten it. But there you go. That's the direction of the angular velocity vector like that. And you might be like, well, what's the point? It's rotating kind of to the right. Why are we defining the angular velocity upwards? Uh, well, it's because it's when we talk about rotational quantities the when an object is rotating like this and all of its parts are moving in different directions um, that's the only way to really consistently define a, a vector for it you know if you think about it the the front of this little object is moving to the right the back side that we can't really see back there is moving to the left this side is moving towards us and that side is moving away from us right so if you were to like vector sum all the velocities of this object, like if you think about the velocity of the front part, the velocity of the side, the velocity of the back, the velocity of, the, of the, each of the sides, you know, the velocity of the back is this way, the velocity of the front's to the right, the velocity of this portion is this way, and the velocity of this portion is this way. They all kind of vector sum to zero. So you can't really, there's no other way to really to define consistently a, a vector associated with this. And when we define torque, it was, it's the same way. 
uh, if I had an object that was being torqued like this, like let's say you're unscrewing a bottle cap or something like that, then um, the torque would also point in the same direction, you know? So we're always consistent with this kind of thing. What that's going to allow us to do is to say that when a torque, you know, acts up, it's going to make the thing rotate like this, basically. And when a torque acts downward, it's going to make the thing rotate back the other way. Same thing with angular velocity and then angular acceleration that we're defined here in a second. Okay, so to complete this idea, let's, uh, let's talk about an object that's moving in the other direction. So again, we'll use the same kind of shape of an object here. But the one change I'll make is we'll just say that it's rotating this way. And again, we'll draw an axis. So as I get to the edge of this um, stylus, or this edge of this pad, it's a little harder to draw straight lines. So um, here's our axis of rotation. It's now just rotating back in the other, other direction. And that means, well, you all tell me, what direction is the angular velocity vector going to point for this one here? down and you just you rotate your fingers in that direction and your thumb points down so that's the direction of the angular velocity vector omega it's going down okay okay so angular velocity the rate at which something is spinning is defined like this that's how fast something is rotating how fast something is spinning that's what that's what it means all right and read The next thing to find is angular acceleration. So if an object is not only rotating, but it's also speeding up as it rotates or slowing down as it rotates, then it's going to have some angular acceleration. We can define angular acceleration. Uh, we use the symbol alpha, and we can say that alpha average is going to be equal to the rate of change, so the change in the angular speed divided by the time interval. And uh, this is going to be measured in almost always radians per second squared. Okay. And then we can um, also talk about, in the same exact way, we can define um, angular acceleration instantaneous to be equal to the derivative. And now, since we've defined the way in which angular velocity can be a vector, we can write both of these equations um, using vectors as well. So alpha average we can define as um, the change in the angular velocity vector divided by the change in time. And then the instantaneous angular acceleration we can define as the derivative of omega with respect to time. And then what we can do is we can say, so if, let's see, if the angular velocity of an object is increasing, Okay, so if omega is increasing, let's say that I, I give you a value of omega that's equal to um, 20 radians per second. Um, and then we'll use, this is the y direction, right? Positive y, using the same, we'll multiply that by j hat. Okay, so let's say I have an initial angular acceleration that's 20 radians per second j hat. And let's say I have an object that's speeding up and it's final or a later point in its rotation, it has an angular acceleration of 40 radians per second, also times j hat. And let's say that uh, it, it goes from here to here in a time interval that's equal to, um, we'll use two seconds, okay? Now, if we just use these vectors, we're going to be able to figure out that the direction of the angular acceleration is going to point up. Okay, and that's pretty easy to see if we do the following. We can calculate what the average angular acceleration is by taking uh, 40 minus 20. J hat and divide by 2 and we'll get an average angular acceleration of 40 minus 20 is 20, 20 divided by 2 is 10. So this is going to be 10 radians per second squared. And then you notice that this is also going to point in the j hat direction. Okay. 
So the direction of the angular acceleration vector will be positive if the object speeds up, and it'll be negative if the object slows down. Okay. When I say j-hat, you're stating its positions in the x-direction. No, j-hat's y-direction. j-hat's the y-direction. Yeah, no, hat's x, yeah. Now, I was saying, like, in this picture here, if we call j, sorry, if we call positive y to be up, then this object would have an angular acceleration whose component would have only a y component, basically. But yeah, what this tells us is if I have an object that speeds up, then its angular acceleration is also going to point in the same direction, right? So I, I could apply this to our two pictures right up here, and I could say, suppose that for this object right here, the one that's rotating like this, I tell you that its angular acceleration vector goes this way. So that's the direction of its angular acceleration. And then I could ask the question, so if I have an angular speed that goes up, or an angular velocity that goes up, and an angular acceleration that goes up, then what is this object doing? Is it speeding up or slowing down in terms of its rotational rate? It's speeding up, exactly. And if I, if I do the exact same thing over here and I tell you that this object, which is rotating to the left or around like this, that had an angular velocity vector that pointed down at a moment in time, if I tell you it has an angular acceleration that points up, What's happening to this one? Is it speeding up or slowing down? Slowing down, yeah, exactly. So it works exactly the same way that, that acceleration and velocity work in linear motion. Because if I tell you I'm driving down a road with a, with a velocity of positive 10 meters per second, and I tell you I have an acceleration of positive one meter per second squared, when the velocity and the acceleration are in the same direction, you're speeding up. But if I'm traveling at a speed of 10 meters per second and I hit the brakes, that means my acceleration's backwards. So velocity forward, acceleration backwards means you're slowing down. So anytime they're in the same direction, you're speeding up. If they're in opposite directions, you're slowing down. It works the exact same way with these rotational quantities, basically. Okay. And again, these are the these are the vectors associated with these. And interestingly enough, these vectors end up becoming very, very important in describing some of the kind of motions that are uh, going to show up later in this class. In particular, the one I'm thinking about is in order to describe how a gyroscope works, you absolutely have to use these definitions of the vectors. And I felt personally as though when I was first uh, learning physics, I felt these, these definitions were a little bit arbitrary. And I don't know if that was because I just wasn't paying attention or if it just wasn't explained well enough or if I just, I don't know. But... I always thought this was really arbitrary. It's like, why do I use a vector that points along an axis to describe an, ac an object that's rotating like this? But the reality is it actually means something. It physically means something that will be important later on. It's actually very interesting. The way gyroscopes work is, is not only interesting, it's, it's also very counterintuitive and surprising. And um, we, we're really going to need these definitions if we're going to understand how they work. Okay, so I think we've defined all the quantities that we need. Um, and so the next thing to do is to talk about what happens when you have an object that moves with a constant um, angular acceleration. Oops, didn't you see that? So when an object has a constant angular acceleration, that means that its average angular acceleration is the same thing as its instantaneous acceleration. And I said above that this was equal to the change in the angular speed, which is like an omega final minus an omega initial, um, divided by the time interval, delta t, over which you, you observe the object. So this is just another way to write the, the expression that I wrote above, which is the change in the angular speed divided by change in time. And if we write it like this, we can kind of basically turn this into one of our kinematic equations um, by just multiplying alpha times delta t and then adding um, omega initial 
and saying that this is equal to omega final. So this is our this is one of the angular kinematic equations that you can use. Again, this only works with constant angular acceleration. Um, the next thing that we can do is we can look at the definition of um, the definition of average angular um, speed. So omega average we said was equal to the change in angle divided by the change in time. And for this next part, I guess it's useful to draw a graph real quick. So if I have an object and I plot its, I plot time on the so-called x-axis over here, and on this axis over here, I plot the angular speed of the object. And then I tell you that the object has a constant acceleration. If an object has a constant acceleration, that means that if I wanted to plot its angular speed as a function of time, would you all agree that it's going to be like a straight line like this? Okay. And then what I'll do is, with a different color here, let's mark off two different points in the motion. Right here and then right here. Okay, so this is going to be the point that we call omega initial, and this is gonna be the point that we call omega final. Right here, right here. And it happens to be the case that if I wanna talk about what the average angular speed is, omega, the average omega. By the way, this symbol is the lowercase version of the Greek letter omega. It's not a W, and many of you are gonna write it as a W. Don't do that. I Like, I get it, and I, I'm not gonna like ever take off points for it, I don't think, but it is one of those things where, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where it's like, when you're explaining this, when you're, when you when you're get, like learning how to do physics or whatever, it's just one of the things you got to get used to is Greek Greek letters, and in physics one a we we tend to use Greek letters for angular motion, but um, it's just about like I'm trying to think of the best way to put this without without sounding like a, just a jerk. You just don't want to look. Um, you don't want to write something that looks bad to one of your professors, I guess is what I'm saying. Like for me, I don't really care that much. Like I understand that a lot of you are just going to write like this equation, you're going to write W zero plus, I don't know how you're going to write alpha, but a lot of people choose their own ways to do that. And you're going to write W final. Okay. I'm just saying that like, even though these two look really similar to each other, to, to a physics professor, this is really, this is going to cause them to cringe a little bit, you know? And I don't know how much I really don't know how much it bothers the other professors at the school, but I do know that these these topics come up in later courses, so you want to kind of learn you want to learn the notation and the language we use, right? It's kind of hard to write down omega sign though. What this sign's hard to write down? This sign's hard to write down, or the, this one? This this sign to write is hard to write down. This one isn't hard to write down. It's just a little curly W. Why is that hard to Why is that hard to write? What do you mean? You just Go like this. I don't understand. It's not hard. <laughs> you just just learn how to do it. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be laughing. I mean, if you say it's hard to do, it's hard to do, I guess. But uh, stop doing it. You know what I mean? Like, at some point, it's like, you can either just be really lazy and, and keep writing W, or you can learn how to do it and just, just write this little curly thing. I'm just saying, you could do whatever you want to do. You can all write Ws if you want to, but it will look bad to your other professors. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to give you advice. Like, um, it's like you don't want to spell. This is the same thing as spelling and grammar and stuff like that. Like, you don't want to write an email to anyone, whether it be your professor or your boss or whatever, that has a lot of grammar errors in it. You don't want to write an email that has a lot of syntax or spelling errors. Yes, basic syntax is what Andrew's saying. Um, it's, that's a better example. It's like writing sloppy code. Even if the code gets the job done, but it's really sloppy, that's bad, right? Or is it considered bad? I don't know. 
it's been a long time since I programmed anything, but I used to have to program stuff and I used to have to share my programming with other people. And I also had to read other people's code and be able to modify it. So it was really important that we were all writing things in ways that we can understand, right? And I suspect that's probably something that any of you, well, all of you will have to do at some point in your lives, right? Okay, so little tiny thing. Um, again, it's not something that bothers me. I've just heard other professors complain about it. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. Okay, so let's go back to this. We have an object that has a constant angular acceleration. That means that if I plot angular speed of the object versus time, if its angular acceleration is positive, then it's gonna have it's gonna be basically a positive positive line right here will represent the motion of that object. And I can identify out the initial angular speed and the final angular speed if I pick two points right here, okay? So the question now becomes, if I look at this equation right here, omega average equal to delta theta over delta t, I don't have any information about delta theta. How can I describe what omega average is? Keeping in mind that delta t is going to be this this time interval here from, from, from this point over to this point right here, that's going to be delta t. So how could I write omega average? Or how could I get, is there any way that I can look at this plot right here? and understand what a, a way to write down what the average angular speed is going to be. If it's hard to understand, I can give values too, and then it might make it easier to figure out. Like if this was 10, omega is increasing over time. Yes, Andrew. That's, what this, that's basically what this says. This is an object, like imagine you, you take your bike, you turn it upside down, you take a bike at one of the wheels and you start hitting it. You start hitting the wheel on the side so it speeds up, it speeds up, it speeds up, it speeds up, okay? And you do so in, somehow in a, in a constant way. Let's say the object went from 10 radians per second here to 30 radians per second here. Can anyone tell me, given those values, what would the average angular speed between that time be? Twenty, right? How'd you figure that out? You don't know t is equal to two. T could be equal to ninety seconds, for all you know. You don't know that t is equal to two. What if t is equal to fifty? How do you figure out what the average speed is? Sorry. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm. Okay. My problem is, I. Okay. Look. You don't look. Look at you're all. You're getting the wrong idea here. Look at the equation. The equation says omega average is the change in angle divided by the change in time. You don't know the angle. What you're all calculating is the angular acceleration. My question is, how do you find the average angular speed? Omega average. If you don't know delta theta, you only know the initial angular speed and the final angular speed. Now, you got the right answer. Someone said the answer was 20, because if you start at 10 and you move to 30, then your average angular speed is definitely 20. But you don't know the time. And I don't want you to give me an answer that has a time in it. I want to get a number. And the answer is 20. The question is, how did you know it was 20? How do you calculate that? Thirty plus ten divided by two. That is the right answer. Thank you, Joanne. That's right. Okay. And the two that you're using there, it's not two seconds, right? It's just the number two, right? Just to be clear that you didn't put units. It's 30 radians per second plus 10 radians per second and the whole thing divided by two, right? That's what you're saying? That's right. Does that make sense to everyone? Because it's an average. Exactly. It's the average. Exactly. Yeah. It's an average. That's it. One way to find the angular speed average is to just average the two values that you have. So we could write this equation as omega initial plus omega final, and then you divide the whole thing by two. And that should be equal to the angular displacement, that's what delta theta is, divided by delta t, right? And this will be true regardless of what the time interval is. It could be 20 seconds, it could be 100 seconds, it could be a year, it doesn't matter. This would still be the average speed. Now, this only works because we're talking about constant angular acceleration. It only works because this is a straight line right? That's the only reason it works. If the object's motion was something like this, it might not be so simple. 
Well, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it would work. Yeah. So it works here though. And this gives us our second equation. We're just gonna rearrange this a little bit here and say that our angular displacement delta theta is gonna be one half of omega initial plus omega final multiplied by delta t. Okay, so that's the second equation. It doesn't have acceleration in it, but it doesn't. this does describe an object that's accelerating. Okay, an object that's not accelerating. So if, the, if alpha was equal to zero, we'll just put this as a side, if alpha is equal to zero, then your equation is just delta theta is equal to omega times t. Okay. So this is a this is a separate this this would be constant or uniform motion basically. All right. Okay. So those we got those two equations, and the next thing that we can do is we can combine these two equations together. Um, how do we want to do it? Let's just do the simple way. So let's substitute in omega final here for omega final here. I'll use a different color. If we do that, we're going to get delta theta is one half of omega naught plus plug in omega final, which is equal to omega initial plus alpha delta t. Multiply all of this out, and you're going to get an equation that should look pretty familiar to you all. So one half of omega initial plus omega initial, so that's two divided by two is just omega naught times delta t plus one half acceleration alpha times delta t times delta t, so delta t squared okay these should start to or these should all look familiar to you because really they're the exact same equations that we had in uh, regular kinematics and then finally we have um, one that's not going to have time in it so I think the easiest way to do that one is to rearrange this equation so it says delta t is equal to um, omega final minus omega initial divided by delta t no alpha oops so solving this one for delta t we get omega final minus an omega initial divided by alpha we can then take that delta t and plug it in for this delta t right here. Okay, so I'll use this room over here to do that. So we'll have delta theta equals we're plugging in for time. So we're going to plug this quantity in for time. And then we get delta theta is equal to, I'm going to move the two and the alpha over here. Omega naught plus omega final times omega final minus omega naught is going to be equal to, I think, omega final squared minus omega initial squared. It's basically a difference of squares right here. It's kind of out of order, but the omega final is the one that's positive in the binomial that has a negative sign, so we're going to get that. And then normally the way this is written is omega final squared equals omega initial squared plus 2 times alpha times delta theta. And there we go. Anyone have any questions? Do a problem now. Mm, so we're going to do this problem from your textbook right here. Yeah, your textbook has this this table right here. I guess we might as well look at this. This table basically shows you the straight line motion with constant linear acceleration. Rotation with constant angular acceleration. Here's all the equations we just derived on the right here. They like to use the subscript Z. I think it makes the equations kind of complicated looking, but these are all the same equations we just derived. These are the equations we derived back in chapter two. You can see that they're pretty much identical to each other with just X replaced with theta, V replaced with omega, and alpha replaced with, or A replaced with alpha. 
And of course, there is no rotational version of time. Time is just time. It doesn't really change. Okay. All right, so here's the problem we want to do. So let's put that on our... Cut out all this other junk. All right. Take this. Copy. Back to one note. We'll also do this one, too. But it uses different units, so I don't want to... We'll do something simpler first. Okay. So, here's the problem. It says, you finished watching a movie on Blu-ray, and the disc is slowing to a stop. The disc's angular velocity at t equal to zero is 27.5 radians per second, so that's going to be our initial angular speed of 27.5 radians per second. And um, it says it's slowing down and its angular acceleration is constant. Alpha is equal to negative 10 radians per second squared. It says a line PQ on the disk surface lies along the x-axis at t equal to zero. So here's the line PQ right here. At t equal to zero, it's right here. So this is t equal to zero, this point in time. It's rotating this way, which, by the way, when an object is rotating, um, this is counterclockwise, right? Can you all tell me what would the direction of its angular accel Sorry. What's the direction of its angular speed? Out of the page, right? And again, if you don't understand how to figure that out, you take your fingers and you point along the way it's rotating and you just kind of rotate your right hand in the direction that it's rotating. So your thumb points out of the page. So this is in the positive Z direction, right? Like if I wanted to write this as a vector, I could write this times what which of the unit vectors would I write over here? I, J, or K. Yeah, K hat, right? And of course we can do the same thing with our angular acceleration vector, right? This is negative 10 K hat, right? Okay, we're not gonna need that for this problem. It's just good to keep asking to make sure you all understand. Um, okay, so we have those pieces of information, this line PQ, it says, what is the disk angular velocity at, so we want to find what is the angular velocity omega final, um, and it says at a time that's equal to three, 0 0.3 seconds, and then it says what angle does the line PQ make with the positive x-axis at this time? So this is part A, and then part B is going to ask us to find the angle, so we're going to calculate the angular displacement, where its initial angle is going to be equal to what? What's the initial? How could I define my initial angle in this case? It's zero, yeah, because we usually define angles relative to the positive x-axis. If it if it starts with this line PQ on the x-axis, that means its initial angle is zero. So. Our goal is to find delta theta, which really just means we need to find the final angle, right? Okay. These problems are really easy to do. So does anyone have any questions before I get started with the calculation? It's worth noting these textbooks are, are great at updating things. This used to be a, a CD, and then it was a DVD, and now it's a Blu-ray. Unfortunately, um, I wonder, do any of you own Blu-rays? Is that something that, like, does, does anyone here own a Blu-ray? Blu-ray player and, like, Blu-ray discs? Xboxes play, what, which, which version? The 360 plays Blu-ray? I didn't know that, actually. So some of you still use DVDs? Okay. I have a bunch of DVDs. I have a bunch of Blu-rays, but, I mean, I, obviously a lot of loot, you know, so. Okay, I just didn't know if, I didn't know, if, like, these days there's no point, almost, in having these things, right? Uh, yeah, it's mostly just digital. You can just go to Netflix or Prime or wherever the video is hosted and you can watch it there. Or you can just download it, obviously, through whatever mean you want to. Or you can just watch on YouTube. Anyway, um, plus, 
I, like Blu-ray is uh, it's pretty high quality. It's 1080p, but that's kind of nothing compared to 4K, which a lot of stuff on Netflix is like 4K now, right? So, I mean, are there 8K things now? Can you buy 8K TVs? Is there any 8K content though yet? Why K Hat, Tom? Uh, the reason why it's K Hat again is that uh, Blu-ray is not 1080p. What are you talking about? Yes, it is. What are you talking about, Kevin? Sure it is. Blu-ray 1080p. I guess you can get Blu-rays that are 720p. Like not, it's not guaranteed to be 1080p, but but that's like the maximum that it can be. Tell something crazy. Are there 4K Blu-rays now? You sure about that? Really? It's hmm. a lot of uh, it's a lot of data to store on a Blu-ray disc. Maybe they have like new layering technology now. I don't know. Like I haven't bought a Blu-ray in so long, so I don't, I don't really know. I wonder if it's real 4K though. Like I wonder if it's actually 4K. Yeah, 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray disc. Do you need like a do you need a special player for it though? I bet it's upscaled. I bet you almost anything it's upscaled. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, just like the, the the video size, I think is too big to fit on a Blu-ray disc. I think Blu-ray can hold like 120 gigabytes, but I think a 4K video is like probably 250 gigabytes plus. Do you need a special player? Like I have 4K TV. 4K TVs are a little more common. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Uh, getting a little sidetracked here, but I find this stuff kind of interesting because I mean I grew up through all these things. I remember like the beta versus DV beta versus VHS wars, and then the then DVDs came out and replaced those, and then after that it was there was like a war between Blu-ray and HD DVD, which HD DVD lost, and then uh, and then here we are now where we live in an era where there's no point of even having optical media anymore, as far as I can tell, because it's so much easier to have like data stored somewhere else and you just stream it, and then pay for the streaming service or whatever. I also remember floppy disks. Sure do. The different types of floppy disks, the five and the quarters and the three and a half inch, before we switch over to using USB drives and just email these days. Okay, so, um, the, oh, sorry, I didn't answer. Ton, you had a question of why is it K hat? The reason why is because when an object is rotating around like this, okay, if you wanted to find the direction of the angular velocity vector, you, you rotate your fingers in the direction that it rotates. And I guess one thing that's not maybe not so obvious here is if I have an x y coordinate system. So if this is the x direction, this is the y direction. The z direction goes this way. This is the positive z direction then, which is also the k hat direction, right? Does that answer your question, Tom? This is just our our. Um, I guess I could say it's our convention for how we define vectors of, that are rotating is we define them along the axis that they're rotating. That's how we define the rotation vector. So do you understand? Okay. It's just like um, this right here, but it's drawn in a two-dimensional plane. I guess the other piece of this that's maybe not so obvious is... You know, if you, I think your math textbooks do this quite a bit different, right? You can tell me if this is right or wrong, but in your math textbooks, do they normally put x this way, y this way, and z up? Is that right? Okay, so x towards you? Oh yeah, this is actually backwards now that I look at it. Yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Sorry, 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 thank you. So this would be x, and this would be y, right? With z up, okay. For me in this class, I normally do the, like, you know, I put x and y on the plane of the page, and then I put z this way. So, just uh, something to get used to, I guess, just in terms of how we might draw things. But... The one thing I wanted to point out is this whole right-hand rule thing, it also defines the way these coordinate systems are work, right? Because if you take your fingers and you rotate from the x direction to the y direction, 
you get the z direction, right? Like if I go from x to y, my thumb points up. That's positive z, right? Same thing uh, in, in this picture over here. If I point my hand along x and I go from x to y, my thumb points out of, out of the board, and that gives me positive z, which is out this way, right? So really, given any set of coordinate systems, like just let's suppose, say I pick a random one. Suppose I put x this way and I make y this way. What direction would the z positive z direction be for this one? Anyone know the answer to that? I'm trying to get you to generalize between these three and figure out what's going on. It's not towards me. If I have the x direction down and the y direction to the left, what direction would the z direction be? Again, you just you point your fingers in the direction of x, you rotate your fingers from x to y, your thumb points in. That's the positive z direction then. That's how it's defined. Like you that's you use the right hand rule, that's how we get these things. Anyway. Okay. Let's solve this problem. Okay, so again, we're given uh, this object. It has an initial speed of 27.5 radians per second. It has an angular acceleration that's slowing down that's constant of negative 10. And we're, our goal first is to find what omega final is. So to find omega final, we can use the equation omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha times t. So omega final is going to be equal to 27.5. radians per second plus negative 10 radians per second squared times t, which is 0 0.3 seconds. So this is going to be equal to 27.5 minus 3, I think, which would be 24.5. Solid, right? You don't have any questions? No? Okay, part B. Um, if I want to find, it says, what is the what angle does the line PQ make with the positive x-axis at this time? So for that, we can just find the change in angle. And I'm going to use all the quantities that were given in the problem instead of using omega final. So we'll have, we're going to use the equation omega initial times time plus uh, one half of alpha times time squared. So that's going to be 27.5 radians per second times time, which is 0 0.3 seconds, plus 1 half negative 10 times times squared, so 0.3 seconds whole squared. Now, the answer that you get here, so I think we normally think of angles as basically going from 0 to 360 degrees or 0 to 2, 2 pi radians, right? But when we talk about angular displacement, an object could rotate around multiple times. So it could rotate through like, you know, 720 degrees, that would be two revolutions, or it could rotate through, you know, 6 pi radians, that would be, how many revolutions would 6 pi radians represent? Three, right? Okay. So you all understand. So what if I said it was uh, seven pi radians? What would seven pi radians mean that the disk did? Three and a half. Yeah. Okay. So you get the idea. So this answer is not going to be between zero and pi, but that's okay. You know, it, it just means the thing keeps rotating basically, right? Okay. Now at the same time, when we define angular like the initial angle, no, I was going to say something that was wrong. That's not even true. Never mind. Okay. So this is a uh, angular displacement. Anyone we'll calculate what this is equal to?
I don't think I can do this calculation in my head. The second part is 0 0.03 times 10, which is 0 0.3 divided by 2. 7.8 is your answer. Okay. So we get 7.8. And if we check our, our units here, it's going to be radians, right? Now, how many revolutions is that? Is that less than one revolution? Is that more than one revolution? It's more than one, right? It's a little bit more than one because one revolution would be two pi radians and two pi is like two times 3.14, which is about 6.28. So yeah, it's a little more than, than one revolution. In fact, if we want to, we could ask the question, how many revolutions is that? And for that, what we can do is we can take um, 7.8 radians and multiply by the conversion factor between revolutions and radians, which is going to be 2 pi radians down here. Um, and in the numerator we'll have one revolution. REV will be revolutions for us. And if we do that, you get 1.24 revolutions. I got 1.24, is it 12.25? That's okay. 1.24 revs. How did you all get 12.25? Oh, okay. Did you multiply by 2 pi? Even then. Yeah, that's okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, all right. Calculator errors happen. All right, so that would be our our change in angle. So we could we could write it either way depending on how it asks. But but that's not really what the question asks, right? What does the question ask us to calculate? I'm sure this happens a lot in your homework problems. It didn't ask us to calculate revolutions and it actually didn't even technically ask us to calculate the the change in angle. It wants what what do I need to do then? the angle from the x-axis, exactly. So this is rotated around more than once. So it rotated around one time and then a little bit more. We do not need to convert it to degrees. No, that's not what we need to do. What we need to do is we need to figure out what Tom answered right there, right? 1.5 radians. Is not 1.5 radians like really close to 90 degrees, right? So our final position for our object is actually like, um, right here. It's actually like somewhere like way up here, actually, now that I think about it. So that's, that's our final position for P and Q. So here's, here's P and Q. Maybe we call them P and Q prime because it's the new position or something like that. And yeah, we need to do, what we need to do is we need to take 7.8 radians minus 2 pi radians because we want to get just the, what we want is this angle here. Let's call it phi or something like that. Gotta be careful calling angles alpha from now on because alpha is this. Is it greater, is, is 1.51 radians greater than uh, two pi? I don't buy that. I, I, that, that doesn't pass my, uh, no, I don't, I don't buy that. Because three divided by two is 1.5. I also don't think that's quite right. Your, your calculation there, Conan. 7.8 minus two pi radians. I'm pretty sure the first one we saw, 1.51 sounds right to me, because this is 6.28, right? It's like 6.3. 7.8 minus 6.3 would be 1.5. Maybe the version of pi that's in your calculator is wrong. This is, this is possible. Okay. All right, it didn't multiply by two. Are you doing like, are you, when you put it in your calculator, are you putting it in like this? Or are you putting it in like two times pi? Because I don't know how your calculator works. 
But for mine, I don't think it likes this. It does like this. I don't even know if you need parentheses. But maybe you're right, I don't know. Okay, so you get 1.52. Okay. Yeah, anything that comes with Windows is by default terrible. So I always recommend finding some other um, some other version uh, to use. I, what I really like to use, uh, as long as you have internet access, I'll just show you what I use if I don't... I mean, normally I just use my phone because my phone's fine. But um, this is a really, really good scientific calculator. It's a really, really good scientific calculator. So like, just, what was the calculation we just did? Um, 7.8 minus 2 pi. 7.8 minus 2. With this one also, I don't know if it'll let me just, oh, does it, oh, there's pi right there. Yeah, that works fine. This is a really good calculator though. Um, it looks really simple, but it, it has everything you need does absolutely everything you need and you can um, you can do stuff like you can click on this and it'll 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 give you back the if we get to a harder calculation here I'll, I'll use this instead of uh, using my calculator and I'll show you anyway so that's the answer and if we want to convert that to degrees we can but we don't really need to um, so this is the angle that I'm calling Phi in the picture and if we want to convert that into degrees in degrees we would basically just say 1.52 and we would just multiply by 180 over pi. Because this is radians and this is degrees. And what we would get is probably about 90 degrees, right? Oh, here. We'll use the calculator. So let's make this smaller so I can actually put it side by side here. So 180. We're doing 1.52. Times one eight zero divided by pi. There we go, about ninety degrees, eighty seven degrees. Now the other thing this does really that's really nice is like I can put seven point I could do this whole calculation really so seven point eight minus two pi. And then if I wanted to do the conversion, I can click this number and it'll put it right there. That's pretty handy. I just like the fact that I can go back and like click things like this. It's just a very usable. When will we study rotational dynamics? We're doing that right now. This is rotational dynamics. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Okay, let's try another problem. Uh, we'll sl we're kind of slowly building up though, Tom. We'll get to harder problems throughout the class today. Okay, so yeah, rotational. So let's, let's talk about what that word means. So rotational just means things that are rotating, which is what we're talking about. And dynamics means, well, things that are moving as opposed to things that are sitting still. So we talked about rotational equilibrium. That was rotational statics would be another way to put it. Uh, that is to say things that uh, are sitting still. Dynamics means things that are that are moving in time that are that are not sitting still, right? So that's, that's, when you say rotation, you just mean things that are rotating. That's all you mean. OK, here's another example of a problem we can do with this. Um, it says a wheel makes 20. This is just the only difference with this one is it has different units. And I just want to make sure that you understand how to convert between the units. It says a wheel makes 22 revolutions in two seconds with a constant angular acceleration. If the angular speed at the end of two seconds is 15 revolutions per second, find the angular acceleration. Okay. So we have a wheel makes 22 revolutions in two seconds. Okay, so two seconds is obviously time, right? What is uh, 22 revolutions? What is what is that? What quantity is that of the ones that we just described? Delta theta, that's right. So our angular displacement then is going to be equal to 22 revs, but we don't really want to write it in revolutions, right? Let's write it in angular like the, the same kind of like radians per second like we did before, and radians like we did before. So we need to multiply this one by 2 pi radians 
divided by um, one revolution, because that's the conversion factor. There are two pi radians in one revolution, so by multiplying by this, you're multiplying by one. So 22 times two pi is gonna be 44 pi. And that's gonna be radians. Okay, uh, it says if the angular speed at the end of two seconds is 15 revolutions per second, so that's gonna be our omega final, right? So omega final is equal to uh, 15 rev per second, which we're gonna multiply by the same conversion factor. Turns out you don't actually have to do these conversions, but I'm just doing it to be consistent. So we multiply by two pi radians per one revolution and we get uh, 15 times two is 30, so 30 pi radians per second. So we have delta theta omega final and t and we wanna find angular acceleration, okay? Now, none of the equations that I gave you allow you to just find angular acceleration from these three quantities. There's another one that I could have given you, but I didn't. I think the, I think the other equation, I'll just put it down here and we can use it later if we want to. I think this, the other equation is this. And you can derive this one if you want to by uh, combining together the other equations and eliminating the initial angular speed in whatever way you want to, you'll always get the same answer. I think that's the equation. We can use that when we're done here. But instead of doing that, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna use the five equations that we that we derived, or the four equations that we derived, and we'll start off by finding the initial angular speed, and then we'll use that to find the angular acceleration. Because we have an equation that says this, Wow, it is 312. We should stop right after we finish this problem. Probably should have stopped before we started. But let's finish it. It's not super long. So omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t. We can use this to find what omega initial is. Omega initial is going to be equal to omega final minus alpha delta t. So it's going to be equal to 30 pi minus alpha, which... Whoops, 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 whoops. We're finding alpha. I'm so sorry. I used the wrong equation. I'm getting ahead of myself. My bad. We want to find omega initial now, which means we need to use this equation. So we can use this to solve for omega initial if we manipulate things like this. 2 delta theta over t minus omega final should be equal to omega initial. So here I just multiply by two, divide by t, and then subtract omega final until we have omega initial by itself. So this will give us two times 44 pi. Radians. Divided by t, which is two seconds, minus omega final, which is 30 pi. So this is going to be 2 over 2, 44 minus 30 is 14. So that's omega initial, which we can then use to use the equation I wrote up here a second ago, which is um, now we can say omega initial, wait a minute, I clicked on the blue thing, there it goes, omega initial equals, or sorry, Omega final is equal to omega initial plus alpha times t. Solving for alpha, we're going to get omega final minus omega initial divided by t equals alpha. So omega final was 30 pi minus omega initial, which is 14 pi. divided by the time, which is two seconds. That's gonna be equal to alpha, so 30 minus 14, 26 over two, I think it's 13 pi. Wait, I'm crazy. 30 minus 14 is 16. When you divide 16 by two, you get eight, which is what someone said in the chat. Thank you. Here we go, these problems are pretty easy. We're going to look at harder stuff when we come back for us, but um, this is kind of the beginning.
All right, anyone have any questions? Okay, let's take a break.